Welcome to the One More Podcast. Our guest today is Tyler McCumber, PGA Golf Tour player, University of Florida graduate, and Jacksonville's very own. We're very excited to have him on the show today. Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. Again, thanks for being here. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, looking forward to it, Quinn. Yeah, absolutely. So he's joining us all the way from Denver today. Uh, and, and you may be wondering why he's in Denver. I, I, I'm understanding you're a pretty big snowboarder as well in the off season. I do enjoy snowboarding. I do. Uh, unfortunately, I'm here for other reasons right now, but uh, maybe a bit more uh, relevant to my career. Um, but, yep, it's nice to be doing it out here in the mountains. Yeah, and I understand you're rehabbing a little bit right now, so it's kind of out there just kind of taking it all in and living that mountain yep. life and uh, looking forward to, to you know getting back on tour here rather quickly. Yeah, definitely. Definitely looking back to getting me to uh, competing. Yeah, well, we're, we're looking forward to that as well. So let's take a, let's take a brief moment here to talk about, you know, as a golfer, as a professional golfer, you know, I often wonder, like, do do you grow up with a golf club in your hand? And what age does this start uh, when you start playing? You know, you hear these stories of two years old. You've seen the you've seen some of the other players. They have clips of it. But when did you start picking this game up? Right. Um, I'm sure I have some pictures around a <laughs> kid with golf clubs, given my uh, my family's uh, past involvement with the with the sport. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say most of my here started pretty young um i obviously was familiar with it around it um i didn't start playing uh regularly until i was a little bit older um around 12 12 13 um uh, but yeah obviously around the sport i'm sure i got some pictures of clubs in my hands. <laughs> so there's hope for someone like me you know i, I you know you did start there's with two years hope. old there's always hope you know um and, and for our audience as i don't know you know your father Mark McCumber as uh as has a rather rather very prolific golf history as well, and so I always ask like, did you grow up? This was, was there pressure to be like dad, or or did you just aspire to say, you know what, I want to be like dad? Yeah, um, it, it's it's funny. Obviously, the situation I grew up in, I get that question uh, quite often. I, um, I would say I was not pushed by anyone to play golf. Uh, you know, it was a decision that I sort of came to on my own. Um, was playing all the other sports. Uh, most of my friends were all playing baseball, uh, just kind of running around the neighborhood being a kid. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that he never really pushed it, but once I showed interest and uh, he got involved and obviously helped me learn a lot of the fundamentals I know about the game and how to play it to this day. Well, I think it's incredible. Probably the best teacher you could have had and a uh, great example as well. And uh, I, I always – I always think back to, um, you know, you, you see these videos of like Peyton Manning with a ball in his hand when he's two or Tiger, you know, swinging that club when he was younger. But I also look at, you know, if there's hope picking it up when you're 12 years old, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, I started this game when I was 30 years old. There's zero chance of hope. Um, it's more of a frustration than it is a, than it is a game at this point. But uh, that's, that's good to hear. You know, I always wonder as a golfer, have you ever seen Charles Barkley swing? Uh, I try not to watch. It. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wonder: yeah, is I've that fixable? That <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's always an interesting one. So, traveling back down uh, memory lane a little bit here at UF, you know, uh, you did you did uh, your college collegiate career, career at UF, and while you were there, um, you know, I know golf, the game of golf, has really just exploded in the last ten years. The popularity, um, social media has helped tremendously. And just the personality of the players has really shown out in the sport. Uh things that are happening now you would never see in the eighties and nineties. And, you know, on campus, did you did you feel like you were that well known as a golfer on campus? People would go, Oh, that's Tyler McCumber. Or or was it like you were still kind of like in the shadows playing golf for the University of Florida? Well, Quentin, you got to look at the timeline that I went to Florida. <laughs> I got there in 2009, which I think we're all familiar with that, that football team. We yes. We had uh, Riley yes. Cooper, Tim Tebow, <laughs> the Pouncey. We had everyone in, you can imagine. So I don't think anyone was relevant on campus other than that football team and basketball team. You so, know, it's uh, <laughs> that is an unfair year to ask that question. You're right. Yeah. And I think for me, you know – and. Th- in the pregame we had before the conversation here, we didn't talk about this, but uh, this is rivalry week for the two of us. Uh, I graduated University of Tennessee. You're a Gator. Uh, you've had much better years here than I have, um, but this is uh, it's interesting. You said that 2009 year, I was at that game, and I'm, I cringed immediately. Um, well, that was that uh, Eric Berry, Tim Tebow collision that happened out there, and uh, you, oh, guys, yeah. you guys yeah. won on the other side of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, those the, you, you had to be there during the glory years. I mean, you had basketball and football during that time, Dominic. I got, yeah, tail end of the basketball, tail end of the football, but uh, and then obviously dropped off 
relatively quick there. Basketball was slower, but football dropped off quick. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was a it was an exciting time to be a part of uh, Gator Nation. Yeah, I couldn't imagine. Sure. That sounds yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. And for the record, and I, I'll say this to if any of my children get the opportunity to go to the University of Florida, I'll be the biggest Gator dad you've ever seen in your life. So, you know, it's a great school, and uh, I definitely think very highly of that university, even during rivalry week. So, um, you, you know, as, as you kind of left your career at the University of Florida and you migrated into the, into the tour and you had multiple stops inside that tour, what, what do you think was probably one of the more, like, exciting moments of your career early on? Like, what was one of the more defining moments when you're like, man, I'm doing this? Um, I mean, just teeing it up for the first time for cash was, <laughs> was awesome. Um, and people, you know, people ask a lot about sort of what golf means to you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to me, it's a, it's a fluid situation where, you know, when I was, a, when I was a kid, I, it was just a, a way to hang out with friends, you know, uh, burn time until dark. Um, and then, you know, later in high school it became a bit more of a grind. I was a bit more focused. Mm-hmm. Uh, you start training, um, maybe with a goal in mind of going to college, winning an amateur event. Um, and then sort of, you know, another, another transition is towards the end of college, you know, when you're looking forward to playing professionally, uh, if that's what you choose to do, um, that was something I sort of had in mind the whole time. Um, so I was very, to say the least, very excited and anxious to tee it up in my first professional event and, and make a check. So, uh, Man, you know, I just, I enjoyed every stage, um, and that was obviously a new one, a new frontier for me. Never, never played for money on a golf course, mm-hmm. and um, I, that was that was exciting in itself. I can't imagine. Now, it, you know, I always vision like you win a big check. Do you literally get a big check? Did they like hand you that to take photos? Like happy the big go check? more style. Yeah, happy. It's exactly uh, what I'm thinking. They did that for a bit, I believe. I've never been handed one of those. Okay, uh, if I have, it would make it for a photo, but never. Uh, I'm not throwing them in the trunk, you know, <laughs> uh, Adam Sandler style, but yeah, it would no, be- no doubt, no doubt. So, you know, um, I, I often wonder, you know, I, I wasn't a golf fan in the eighties. Uh, I didn't have the patience for it to watch it. And I was also much younger. Um, and then in the nineties, same thing. But as I grew into the late nineties, I became more fond of the sport and super appreciative of it. And what I noticed during what little bit I remember to now is there's been this morphing of the athlete inside of golf. You look at the 80s and the 90s golf prototype. You look at today's prototype. And I asked myself this question, and I think I've heard announcers say it, but I think they're just kind of like talking. But is there is there a reason why we see so much more of an athletic trend prototype, body type-wise, of the golfer today than in the 80s and 90s? Does it add that much more to the game, or is it more of a lifestyle? I would say it's both, um, but okay. it's definitely added added to the game. Obviously, you had some early pioneers in the gym, Gary Player, um, some fit players. I don't think it was as common as it is today, uh, especially that late 90s, early 2000s era where Tiger started to put on some mass, and you saw the advantage of the strength. You know, you saw him dominate at the majors when the rough is up. Uh, you saw sort of that sustainability. Um, I would say overall, the shift, in um being in better physical shape maybe stronger bigger healthier better um is all for sustainability our schedule is now you know through the year yeah um although they are changing that a bit um you know the last i'm not sure exactly how many seasons it's been but there used to be an off season you know i remember my dad would come home in the fall and um you know we would all hang out and i do recall functions and stuff that doesn't that doesn't exist as of now, and so and it hasn't for the last few years. So I think when people realize oh, I have to play, you know, year round, I don't mm-hmm. really get that time off. Um, they realize being in better shape, eating better, taking care of themselves, I think produce more consistent results. No, that's a good way of looking at it. You know, I, I yeah. definitely I definitely uh, can agree with that that off season and, and lack of. I always wonder, like, I turn on the TV, I'm like, golf's on every single day. Like, I don't remember this being a year round sport, but it is. And you know, the golf channel and it's just it's it's everywhere now. And multiple tours too. So I think that, you know, yeah. there's multiple coverage of it nonstop. And there's such a um there's such an uh, a demand in the sport now because of the awareness. There's so much more competition it feels like. And there's always someone that feels like they're chasing or aspiring to get to the highest level and get on tour. So it's almost like you know someone's behind you and you got to keep going. Is that is that something you kind of see as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, once someone, once a player raises the bar, um, whether it's you or them, you know, obviously everyone kind of has to do it to keep up. Mm -hmm. And that's something, you know, for me, I think I'm a bit partisan to sort of that early 2000 era because that's kind of when I got into golf and was watching Tiger dominate. Um, And, you know, some of the other players were obviously great players and highly competitive, but they couldn't keep up, you know, Mm -hmm. distance, strength. um, It was limiting. Whereas nowadays you see, you look at the tour through the board, there's a lot of long hitters. There's a lot of strong yeah. guys. Um, and they sort of close the gap on that separation from someone who wants to work out. So that makes yeah, sense. It definitely, definitely plays into it. So besides your father, what player did you aspire to be or who did you follow as like a um, someone you looked up to and wanted to be a part of in the game? Yeah, growing up, um, I always loved sort of the the rhythm and uh what would be the word? fluidity <laughs> um, of Retief Goosen, Ernie L's swings, okay. like the way they kind of went around the golf course. Um, that was sort of a, the era, you know, that I, the tail end of dad, they came in and those were the people I saw on the TV. I felt like the most, um, you know, Tiger, Retief, VJ, Ernie L's. Um, you know, I, I love watching Tiger compete. Uh, obviously he's, he's magical. He, he, uh, he just can turn it on when he needs it. Um, say a blend of those two. Okay. Yeah. We're, no, we're those, probably my favorite. Yeah. That's, that's very cool. Very cool. So speaking of that, what was the funniest pairing you've ever been a part of? No matter what tour it's on, but who, who's been one of the guys you're like this, this joker, I can't even swing. He's making me laugh so hard. Oh man. I would almost say it's the flip. It okay. was the irony of how funny I to this day, I know Ben Crane is. And I think we all have seen his videos. I, okay. You know, one of the the founders of, I, I believe, Golf Boys, right? Mm-hmm. Wasn't he and Matt crew did the musical? But he's also funny on his own social media, his own record. Um, I got paired with him, and I was excited. It's my one of my uh, my brother-in-law's favorite players. Okay. Um, you know, and they were out at the tournament. It was Napa. It was one of my first events. I think it was before I was on tour. So maybe 18. Okay. Um, and I get paired with Ben Cran. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. You know, he's going to be entertaining the whole day. Dude was the least funny human I have ever been with for four and a half hours. <laughs> Wasn't mean, but was not funny. Just just straight <laughs> serious took, the entire time. He took a ton of time. He didn't crack one joke. He was very serious. And I was like, this is Ben Crane, right? Is this, like, <laughs> is this his doppelganger or twin brother that's like, found it for the turn? He's playing like Ben Crane. Um, but yeah, I would say that was the funniest because of the irony of how funny he is off the course and on the course was not at all. So just a complete switch, like, Hey, in the social media and everywhere else joke, get on the course, just business. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm expecting so much more and this is not happening. Very nice. Very polite, very supportive, but you got done and you cracked a joke. Nothing for the 18 holes. (laughs) That would be odd. That would be like, Hey, I'm waiting on the punchline. Like, please say something yeah um well the opposite of that is who's the most intimidating pairing you've been with intimidating pairing um i mean it's hard not to reference sort of playing with tiger in 20 at tory pines on saturday um i like to I like to admit that I power played him by showing up late to the tee <laughs> last one there, but uh, I actually had the tee time wrong, so uh, it wasn't intentional. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, it was like a 21 tee time, and I thought it was 25. I show up at like 20. <laughs> you know, like, we're being off in a minute. You're like, uh, great. Quick introductions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, I'd say that was the most, uh, the atmosphere. Just was, the mass crowd following him? Oh, yeah. It was uh, a couple weeks right before sort of the pandemic hit and mm-hmm. the tour was, um, you know, impacted in regards to shutting down and, yeah. and making decisions. And so we had, I want to say, uh, there was a report that on the first hole, there was 20,000 people estimated watching, which obviously that's a gallery friendly course, it's right. not limited space, but, um, it was like nothing I've ever, ever experienced or, and or seen in person really. Wow. You know, I always yeah. ask myself, I'm like, I don't know how they don't hit anybody in that crowd 
and those lines when they're teeing off. It's just there's a lot of confidence not in you guys or excuse me in you guys, but in that audience too. Like a lot of confidence oh, yeah. that you get nothing's gonna no one's gonna have the shanks and hit somebody over here. Um, so I heard a rumor that you were playing with Tyler Tiger, excuse me, and you were wear, you had a reverse mohawk at the time. I did. I had a mohawk. A mohawk. I'm That's it. A mohawk. mohawk. And I heard, I heard he he was uh he 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 said something about the mohawk, and then also referenced if I could do it, I would do it. You want to tell us a little bit about that? I see you laughing there. Yeah, it's um. I'm surprised that story's gotten out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I uh, so we got off of I want to say the 15th hole, mm-hmm. um, and it's been pretty focused. There's not a a ton of communicate. You know, it's the weekend right. and you, you're grinding. It's a it's a big course, you know, you're kind of saving your energy. Um, we get to the 15th green and it was, a, a uh, it was first responder day. So oh, that's cool. we had a, a firefighter, um, pin the pin, which is a, you know, an American flag. Mm-hmm. You take off your hat, shake their hand before you, when you finish the whole march of the next team. Okay. So we were walking sort of in line. He's behind me and take off my hat and, and, and you know, thank him for his service. Uh, and go to put my hat back on. He does the same as we're walking away. He goes, what's that under your lid? <laughs> and um, sure enough, I, I took off my hat, and I had this, like, nasty little, little mullet that came down, but it was <laughs> tied into a mohawk, in part just because my naturally receding hair is the only haircut I could do at the time. And, um, and he goes, that's pretty cool. Is that what the kids are doing these days? <laughs> and I go, uh, I don't know if I would claim that they're doing it. I think it takes more than one person to say that people are doing it. <laughs> I seem to be the only one right now. I don't know if that's a good thing. And he goes, and he kind of like tapped me. He goes, well, he takes off his hat. He goes, if I had hair, he goes, I'd be there, right? I'd be there to support you. I would do it too. So, um, I think that kind of shows his personality a little bit, you know? Yeah. People kind of look at him and, you know, you hear stories or you watched whatever and you think something. He's always, uh, I've heard nothing but good stories like that. And, uh, he's a pretty, pretty interesting guy so that's kind of cool yeah. thanks for sharing that story um yeah you know and and <laughs> i was gonna ask you this one and i can't wait to hear this who is the biggest trash talker on the tour whether it's locker room on the course i've always wondered like you know when i play with buddies there's just it's not stop chirping and i know there's a, such a, a more respectful manner in the game at your level but i gotta imagine there's still some some ribbing going on out there yeah, that's a that is a good question. I would say, in competition, mm-hmm. um, I would say the majority of people kind of let their game try to do the trash talking. Like that you said, sense. it is it is a bit more of a you know cordial. It, uh, what's the word? Um, it's sort of a more of a respectful competitiveness in the atmosphere. Um, I would say most of the trash talking, witty witty digs and stuff, are kind of on the putting green, maybe post or after a tournament Mm -hmm. um or maybe in the locker room um and it's kind of between your friends i don't think there's just jabbing um but i mean i would say that there's less and less of that okay Uh, maybe right when i got out there or even some of the guys i know that you know were out there 10 15 years ago Mm -hmm. uh playing pranks on each other and stuff uh you know my good buddy out there is sam Ryder. he's always He's he's a pretty he's a pretty good trash talker. Some of the local guys actually, Vinny Cavello is a good trash talker. Um, you know, you have uh, Pat Perez would always throw in something there. Uh, you know, Charlie Hoffman. Um, just it, it kind of depends on who you're close with. I would yeah. say it was it's more of a friendly, thing more of a friendly circle. Than, like, yeah, almost like, like get under your buddies skin out and, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's not like a, I would imagine you know the, the tournaments that I've been to, you've never seen anyone say something to jade another player while they're playing you know and uh, i often you know uh, i talk about that with my son and my daughter and my wife and uh you know my son you know he says well dad you know i I understand but well you know it's not like football or basketball and i said no they're not carrying a metal club with them when you say something in football or basketball i couldn't imagine tosh talking someone with you know 12 clubs in their bag they can do some damage you say the wrong thing uh like it or yeah, not, a little repercussion yeah, that's repercussion. right that's right or even if you took their clubs and accidentally threw them in a lake you know there's no telling what could happen there but uh, i always thought that yeah. was interesting so um something i think i know the answer to but i don't always uh i don't always want to assume you guys get how many 
golf balls to finish a round, just out of curiosity? How many are you allowed in a tournament? How many? Uh, so, like, if you had, like, man, there's a rule into how many balls you can have. I'm unaware of it. I, oh, really? I carry two sleeves. Yeah. Okay. So, there isn't um, a rule. I always wonder because, like, why are some players, I had someone tell me, and this just shows my ignorance, why is it sometimes they'll give a ball? later deeper in the in the final rounds to a kid or or to a a patron but they won't do it early on probably just because they have the ability to give away balls without worrying about running out yep gotcha (laughs) you know if i give four balls away on the third hole then it's a lot of pressure playing with two balls you know and (laughs) one gets stuffed up it's funny someone asked me this the other day I don't know why this is a hot topic, unless this is in like media right now. No, but, it's uh, not someone, at all. It's just right, because someone asked me at PT, they go, "How many balls can you carry in your bag?" I'm like, "Man, I, I think you can carry as many as you want." I go, "At some point, though, your your caddy's going to pick up the bag. And he's going to fire you. So, <laughs> unless you want to be the most unpopular player on tour, understood? In the caddy community, understood. I suggest you keep it under nine. Okay, that makes sense. So, yeah. you know, the reason I asked was, you know. Um, Moral obligation. <laughs> my uh, my son, when he was younger at the at the TPC, uh, Heinrich Stenson gave him a ball. It was really cool. But prior to that, there was another player I'm not going to mention uh, came through and said, "You know, I don't, I can't. You know, we're only allowed so many." And I didn't know what he meant by that. So that that's why I was wondering, like, we're only allowed so mm. many. And maybe it was just maybe it's just you know something he said just to kind of make the moment go by. Um, yeah, but, not aware of that rule. Okay, well that makes sense. Then. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So. LIV tour, you know, obviously a hot yep. topic. It's out there. Um, it's the new competitor to the market, the flashy new item. You know, is this good for the game, or is this is this a potential demise to the to the sport of golf, if you may? Yeah, obviously that is a hot topic right now, um, and one that I've been a bit removed from because mm-hmm. I've been out of the tour since the players last year. So I'm, you know, not in entirely familiar with uh everything that's going on day to day uh just sort of what i hear and what i ask but um obviously it is something new you know um and it is a competitor in the market and all i can really speak to is sort of the changes it has influenced the tour to make Mm -hmm. um which as a you know a current pj tour player and and what i've chose to play and stay on is um you know i've been positive uh changes to the tour you know for the players um and i would say sort of have the players back um so from policy of what i'm familiar with i'm not familiar with behind the scenes live policy Mm -hmm. other than what i hear which is the same as you in the news um you you know i can only really speak to what the tour has done because of them and it's gotten better so that's good you know so sounds like it's a win-win you know any the old adage iron sharpens iron uh, really yeah. shows up, and you know, competitors only make those around them better, whether you like it or not. You know, if I right. if I'm the only game in town, I'm probably gonna sit back a little bit. But if I'm pushed another direction, you know, that's that's not a bad thing for those around me and uh, right. and the people that I'm with. So that's a that's a good thing. You know, would you say that um, would you say that it's fair that players be banned from PGA events specifically? Um, you know, the big four, that they're banned for life from that? Does that seem a little harsh that you're just going to say you're banned for life versus saying, well, we're going to back up and punt and reevaluate? Are you, when you mention the big four, are you speaking about the majors? Correct. Yes, sir. Right. Well, I think that's sort of been the hot topic in regards to the tour, um, you know, doesn't make, essentially fully make the call on the majors is what I'm under the impression of. You know, obviously separate, it's two separate organizations that Mm -hmm. are having to, collude with each other to make decisions and there's a whole you know process to it in regards to having a strong field uh world golf rankings is obviously a big topic um you know i I was i'm i I wasn't approached to go to live um you know that i don't think they were looking for sort of the the demographic of where i fall out on the tour Mm -hmm. at this moment um obviously looking at the top guys to to get those people that are uh, ranked high in the world um and you know not having been a top one of the top players over the last three four years um I'm, they weren't knocking on my door right away so uh and have not so you know i have not been approached but yeah it's um yeah it's pretty pretty layered and i i think 
I do think that banning is sort of threatening verbiage, you know, um, mm. but there is a lot of unknown, you right. know, so I understand both, you know, I understand Makes that sense. it's a bit hard. I understand that there's protective mechanisms that are mm-hmm. sort of necessary to protect the business and a business model. And so, like I said, I'm not behind the scenes. I'm not making those decisions, I, um, but I am familiar with them. Um, and I, I do think it's layered. I think there's tiers of it, you know, from legal battles to just the ability to play in certain tournaments, um, being able to kind of cherry pick both tours. Right. Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios that are uh, on a, on a sort of scale of unpopular to popular. You know, so, I kind of, I kind of equate it in my head cause I'm trying to break it down and, you know, I was talking to my wife about it and she was asking questions and I thought, you know, it's almost like if the AFC never played the NFC. Or if the MLB had the the American League never play the National League and they were two separate organizations and they didn't coexist, um, I thought you know I thought from from an aspect how strange would that be, and what would that be like? What would that do to stadiums? What would that do to fan bases? Um, and I wonder, in my mind, right? I think it's a question a lot of people are asking: is why can these two organizations not coexist and make a league out of that, and almost mm-hmm. treat it such as AFC NFC in that particular analogy? Yeah, no, it's a. I never thought about it in regards to the the football aspect, um, sort of that dynamic. Uh, golf is such a unique sport. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not seasonal. It's played year round. Um, it's a worldwide, you know, pretty much worldwide, globally, um, a global scale sport. Uh, you know, it's unique. Um, you have the individual contractor aspects, um, not playing for teams, but then mm-hmm. with live, you have that. It's a totally different structure, you know, uh, from the structure of the tournaments to the structure of your employment to the, um, and I honestly don't know where it's going. Um, and I think anyone that says they do, uh, you know, it's sort of created this, uh, it's sort of its own entity that's Mm -hmm. going to take, uh, its form and it's kind of out of control uh you know of not out of control in a bad way but it's just who knows what it'll be in five years yeah i was gonna say 10 years down the road let's see how this thing turns out and what it looks like if it's even a thing anymore right even if it exists you know um go ahead yeah i I do know in regards to just sort of the climate of the only thing that I, i love being um you know a patron and being a a fan um obviously i chose to support the tour um because that's what i'm playing and that's sort of the that's where i've been the last Mm -hmm. you know eight years seven years as a professional you know i've been in the ranks of working my way to the tour um but there is just obviously an overall climate of polarization in general um not just in the golf community political community Mm -hmm. uh, between humans and you know it's it's a bummer to see it sort of come into sort of the sport world into my world, into my career, you know, and uh, maybe that was inevitable, but I'm not a huge fan of that. You know, I just, I, you know, obviously working together is great. I know that that's very complicated, um, but I hate being, having to told to take sides, you know, um, cause I can see the benefits in a lot of this stuff, you know, I that's can see, a- I can already feel the benefits on the PJ tour policy wise that we gained from it. So, you know, I like to try to keep my mind focused on those. Um, that's a really yeah. good point. You know, that's such yeah. a good point to think of. You know, you talk about the divide in our country right now, and a lot of it yeah. driven by social media, or more importantly, you know, governmental divide right now, and what's yeah. what's coming from that. You hate to see that, like you said, carry over into the sports world and your world at all. And I didn't even think of it like that. It's such a great point. Yeah. So there's some players that have lost some sponsorships going over there as well. Um, but, uh, you know, and then there's, there's just, you can see where the companies are also divided. Their allegiance lies with the tour and there's some sponsors that have pulled back. Um, you know, what's interesting to me is that companies would also take a stance on that. And I know why they're doing it. We don't have to get into that. Um, mm-hmm. but I thought that that was interesting. And, uh, you know, currently you're sponsored by Travis Matthews is one of your sponsors and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a great brand out there, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how, what was it like to get sponsored? How did that come about? Um, obviously through your agent, but how does it come about getting sponsored by one of the largest golf brands out there? Yeah. Um, I, I'm pretty fortunate to have obviously a great agent, Eddie mm-hmm. Smith and a, and a, and a great team behind me, you know, including those endorsements and sponsorships. 
um, from equipment to to clothing, soft goods, um, just to overall morale. You know, um, you create the relationships with these companies, and they end up being, you know, more than a business relationship. Um, you know, obviously there is that common commonality between the two of you, but um, mm-hmm. you know, they're reaching out, asking how I'm doing with therapy. You know, oh, that's uh, cool. a lot have offered you know, help and support throughout the process. So, um, you know, it goes beyond just wearing Travis Matthew shirts. They're a great brand. Um, you know, I obviously love their, I love the product, but, um, I like sort of what they're, they're standing for, what they, uh, not only their aesthetic look, mm-hmm. um, the fact that I can go grab a beer after, you know, practice and you know, have a hard day of practice and go get tacos at Taco Lou and not feel like I'm, you know, all golfed up yeah. wearing my white golf shoes. But, um, which I'd probably be more uh, blending in more if I did that in <laughs> Ponte Vedra. But uh, probably, yeah. For no, sure. I like what they stand for. They've been super supportive. Um, everyone that you know, business wise, I'm aligned with right now has been uh, really supportive. So that's it's fantastic. Great. And a great yeah. brand, and I think it's awesome to hear stories about you know coexisting together and then even simple things like calling, checking in on you, see how you're doing. Do they ever bring you into the the war room, the design room, and they're like, hey, how is this going to work on the golf course? Do you ever think like this is a great idea for a shoe, apparel line, hat? Did they bring you into that with some like ideologies to get your input into that? Yeah, yeah, they That's do quite often cool. actually. Wow, um, and, and even with uh, you know R and D of golf equipment, you know. I don't know the, the, you know, the technology behind it, but I do know the playing aspect and what you, you know, maybe one out of a ball or one out of a club or, you know, maybe uh, a material that is better sweat resistant. Um, and the fit, you know, they might, uh, Travis Matthew does your own fit, personalize your shirts, um, your insoles for their shoes, equator shoes. Um, so there, there is a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, but I think it's just to better their product for playability. Um, that's, and as well as for us individually. Yeah, no, that's really cool. That's awesome they do that. I've always wondered that. Um, yeah. And as we kind of like exit the LIV conversation, you know, what what are your what are your aspirations post rehab? I mean, obviously that's win, right? We talked about that. But you know, right. if you were to break down a comeback, you know, obviously there's steps. You just can't go out and you know win everything the next day. There's 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 a there's a, a goal and there's a ladder in mind to get to the top. What's your plan? post rehab to get to that next level well obviously my number my number one goal right now you you did ask post rehab but my number one goal is just to get healthy okay you know um my shoulder this is my second shoulder surgery um the first one was prior to being fully exempt on the tour so i wasn't able to take a medical for it i had to just take a leave absence essentially from the game not being able to play or practice in pt um and then after having it get its worse at the players um you know literally subluxing and, and popping out in swing mm. um i tried to go the pt route uh to avoid uh surgery and that didn't get it to where it needed to be so thus then having to get surgery where i'm going with this is that my my main goal is to get healthy you know i i, I can appreciate that i've been lucky i you know i'm in i'm in good shape and i've been able to play but I haven't been able to practice and play as much as I would like to regularly because of the sort of mitigation of this getting bad mm-hmm. and, um, and getting worse. And essentially, you know, what it is, is, is my ligaments. Um, I've had damage to my shoulder. It wasn't one particular injury, but genetically my, my shoulders have very elastic ligaments. Um, having dislocated it, having used it for every sport, golf my whole life, surfing, mountain biking, very yeah, short swimming. Worked. <laughs> um, yeah, very shoulder prone activities. Um, it gets worked. It stretches out combined with those injuries of dislocation. There's no primary stabilizer in there. So mm-hmm. essentially these other muscles come in to stabilize your trap, your mm-hmm. lat, your whatever they are, and they get fatigued and get, um, uh, tendonitis, right. you, know, you get tendonitis in your, and everything else. And so essentially you kind of have something that's operable, but not sustainable, you know? Gotcha. And so I got four anchors put in the back there and you know, this shoulder is not going anywhere. <laughs> Unless you put me on one of those medieval torture stretchers, I'm probably going to be good. Uh, but yeah, number one goal is to get healthy and then come back. Uh, you know, I'm able to work a little bit on the mental stuff um, right now, visualization, mental toughness, maybe a bit of st- strategy and schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, but apart from that, I'm just really staying in the moment and getting healthy. Good for you. Well, the one thing I know, um, they labeled you as 
one of golf's toughest guys. And uh, I know that uh, with that label, that uh, we're going to talk about that for just one second. But with that label, you'll be able to make this come back and get back priority number one rehabbed and ready to go. But let's talk about this toughest guy label that I, I was talking earlier about that I read, and you, you made a really yeah. funny joke about that. But uh, you know, this is this the the irony behind the the headline is actually what happened. Do you mind describing that for just a moment? Yeah. So it was at uh, it was at Riviera, the Genesis Invitational. Um, and uh, two years ago, and I had a uh, man. I was staying in an older hotel um, in Santa Monica, mm-hmm. and there were two windows. And I was going uh, going to close uh, open before I left because they didn't have AC. Um, you know, I wanted the room to kind of get an ocean breeze, so I went to open the window. It didn't move very easily, so I had to I had to really put my back into it. Opened it, went to the next window, thinking it was the same <laughs> setup, and that thing was on wd-40 like the day before <laughs> you know and i went to i went to open it with the same force as the previous one and my the my finger um basically the seal the sill of the window went like this and this oh. whole thing now was just hanging like that oh. the whole nail bed everything so i kind of patted it down wrapped it up after almost throwing up i go straight to the course this is on wednesday and um Fortunately, the they always have a medic on site. Okay, uh, you know, a medical doctor on site for emergencies and stuff. And uh, he happened to be a hand surgeon, oh. Doctor Modaber. What's the odds? And um, I go, man, I this is obviously pretty bad. I don't know if I can get it to. I want to play. You know, um, doesn't look like it's really doable right now. And he did the surgery, took it all. I have it on video. <laughs> took it all off, um, sewed the nail bed, which was attached, back Ooh. in there. So I just had a a nasty nail bed and no nail. Yeah. And he goes, probably won't get a nail. Yeah. Probably won't grow back. Odds are you won't. You must have a little stub. Yeah. And he grew back. I got a couple, it's all messed up. I got a couple nails, but, uh, I wrapped it up. It was dripping in blood played. I was, I think I was leading or in definitely top three after two rounds, but obviously it had a set of metaphene more off on the weekend. (laughs) I didn't play, I didn't play with it. Worth anything. Well, but, you um, said they did that on the ninth hole. They did that surgery on the ninth hole. Yeah, right to the right of the <laughs> the right of the ninth fairway. Yeah, that's incredible, Charlie. You're going to, have to pull this photo up. I saw it online. He's in a swing. Oh, yeah. You just finished oh, yeah. the swing, and you see the blood coming down the coming down the golf club as he's playing this tournament. I mean, it's crazy. I did a little first round interview, and uh, I had my hand on the side. I, I I had to cut my glove because you can't take your glove off of right. the wrapping, and. uh so the gauze that was wrapped around in the tape was just full of blood dripping while I was doing the interview to the side all on the floor. What is going on? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Things numb by now. So you know what I say to that? When people say golf is not a physical sport, I dare to challenge them with this commentary right here. Because, uh, you know, surgeries, cut fingers, fingernails gone, and you're still playing. Yeah. Uh, pretty pretty incredible. It speaks to your toughness. You know, Tyler, I just want to say you know, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your stories. Uh, it's great having you on the show. And uh, I just can't say thank you enough. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Quentin. It was fun spending the day. And uh, wish you all the best with the podcast. And lucky to be on here. And Yeah, absolutely. And good luck with the rehab. Charlie, you want to say a few words before we go? Um, yeah, just real quick, Tyler, my man. So good to have you. Um, you are part of a nonprofit organization. Um, can you talk a little bit about that before you go? Yeah, great point. Yeah, I've been... Um, the one I've been the most fully involved with is, is, uh, one wave, uh, one wave is all it takes. Um, I can find the, maybe y'all can pull up the exact, uh, mm-hmm. the web address. If someone wants to visit, they do have social media handles, one wave. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically saltwater therapy mixed with fluoro therapy, um, or, uh, in surfing, um, uh, for mental health, mental health awareness, um, uh, mental health, mental health outreach, um, sort of a platform to be able to seek help on sort of the full spectrum from from just getting encouragement to your peers to your community and, and or if you want to seek uh professional help and counseling will so you, um that's send something me some that, links later yeah yeah i will I'll, I'll I'll text them, yeah. to you. what a great um, the other is is gnome surf project which is actually um aligned a lot with one wave similar okay. stuff um they use art therapy yoga ecotherapy experiences the ocean um to reach sort of uh 
you know, all, all sorts of people, all demographics, um, for mental health, uh, and well-being. So that's, um, that's, those are the two main ones I've been involved in. Okay. Uh, one way we actually started a chapter in Jack's, um, been a little busy the last year, so it's been tough, but my sister, Megan, um, and Addie and my entire family, Charlie as well, has been very supportive of that. That's great. Had a bit of traction. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where, uh, my involvement has gone uh, off the golf course. That's great. So One Wave and Surf Gnome, two charitable organizations. Yep. Hey, again, thank you for being on the show today, Tyler. Toughest man in golf, but also just a genuine person. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories today. And uh, we look forward to you getting you know healthy and back on the course. We'll be cheering you on here from uh, from the What's Your One More podcast. Thank you again. Thanks, Quentin. Appreciate Take care. You guys. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Got one more shot, I'm going to make you. One more chance, I'm going to take you. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah